As President Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski was a key architect of America's Cold War strategy. Now his new book, Strategic Vision, offers his view of America's role in the world today as power shifts from the West to the East. Welcome. Good to be with you, Charlie. It's good to see you. Uh, tell me what the vision is that you see today and whether America is truly in decline in its power in the world. America is not itself in decline, in the sense that many aspects of America are changing positively, although we have some overwhelmingly complex issues to confront. The problem is that others are rising more rapidly than we. The rise of the rest, as they say. Exactly. So there is a relative decline. That's how power changes, generally speaking, mm. over time. So that is a challenge we have to face. But we have to recognize the fact that unlike the recent past, we now live in the age of complexity of no power being capable of being dominant totally. So we have to have a foreign policy that competes and at the same time intelligently addresses the complex issues that we collectively confront. Now, are you at odds with the president when he said in his State of the Union address, anybody who thinks America's in decline doesn't know what they're talking about? I think he was oversimplifying it. I can see how he as president can't say we're declining. But the fact of the matter is there are many aspects of American life of our sort of society that is stagnating. There is some say a decline in trust between the United States and China and that China uh, got some of the American ire up when it exercised its veto in the Security Council about a resolution having to do with Syria. Well yes I think on both sides there are growing resentments on the Chinese side, there is a little bit of what might be called triumphalism. It's kind of sense of gratification that we have domestic problems and that relative to us, they're rising and expect to surpass us. On our side, there is some resentment of that and also some inclination, in my judgment, perhaps misguided, to line up with some Asian powers that view China as a rival or as a threat and to do so in a slightly clumsy way and therefore convince the Chinese that we're already ganging up against them. So yep. we both have to be careful. If you were the National Security Advisor today, what would you be advising President Obama to do about Syria? When he says Assad must go, he better have a policy to force him out. So first of all, don't make statements you cannot follow up on. Secondly, in this particular case, we have to follow the advice and work closely with the Turks and the Saudis. These are the two countries with the biggest direct interest and with the possibility of doing something. And let's work with them and through them, but not take the lead and certainly not just verbally. If the world is not able to stop the violence in Syria, will history judge it badly? That depends entirely on the outcome and we don't know yet what the outcome is going to be. But it gets worse day by day. Yes, but what might happen, you know, we have no way of predicting. Look at Libya. We were very happy to get rid of Gaddafi. Do we have democracy today in Libya? Do we have stability? No, we have competing forces trying to take power. Exactly. So this could go on for a long time. In the case of Syria, it's complicated by the fact there are two powers that are indirectly competing against each other within Syria, but indirectly, mm. Iran and Israel. Let me move to Iran. Will sanctions work? both in terms of oil and in terms of financial transactions? They work already to an extent that they weaken Iran and they make domestic stability more difficult for the Iranian leadership to maintain. I don't think they will work in a kind of decisive fashion if our objective is to deprive the Iranians entirely of their nuclear program and to humiliate them to boot. The president has said it's unacceptable for Iran to have nuclear weapons or the capability to make nuclear weapons. Do you believe it's unacceptable? We have North Korea already possessing nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and we find that unacceptable. So the word unacceptable is again one of these words which means a lot and at the same time, sometimes nothing. So what would you advise a president if the, if the Israeli Prime Minister comes to the Oval Office and the Israeli Prime Minister is coming to the Oval Office within the next month and says we have to go because we believe time is not on our side with respect to doing something about Iran. Not only are they developing the capability, but they're also developing an immunity from attack. 
what I would say to them is this. First of all, we deterred the Soviet Union, which was much more threatening than Iran ever will be. We deterred China. We are deterring North Korea. We can deter Iran. And second, we will proclaim the United States that any threat from Iran involving nuclear weapons or even other kinds of weapons against any country in the Middle East, Arab or Israel, will be viewed by the United States as a threat against the United States and but, respond accordingly. But as you know, the problem is not just Iran having nuclear weapons, being able to contain them. It is that there will be nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. No, and not, more and more countries not, not will at all. Go. Not at all. If That's what they say. I don't care what they say. You know, you have to have much more than just the capacity to build nuclear weapons. You have to have delivery systems that are tried and tested and capable of delivering nuclear weapons. You have to have a lot of other systems systems to make it operative. Mm -hmm. I think a guarantee from the United States of complete protection, which has satisfied the Japanese and the Koreans, which has protected the Europeans under much more threatened conditions, can work in the Middle East. But we have to be firm and credible about it. And we also have to say a conflict is not in our interest because we know if there's a conflict, we will be hit by the Iranians. Do you want another war in that part of the world? Do you want the price of oil to go up? Do you want our troops in Afghanistan and in Iraq to be threatened? I mean, I don't understand how anyone can seriously argue that this is in the American interest. To see Iran bombed uh, and That's create right. and unleash their whatever armaments they have against the Middle East and or the United going to do States. It. What evidence is there except anxiety and fear that they're going to do it? So the sum total of what you believe about this is that we can live with a nuclear Iran. Look, I don't want to live with a nuclear Iran. I would like to make it uncomfortable for them to seek it. I would like to promote internal change in Iran, which is more likely if we don't fuse Iranian nationalism with Iranian fundamentalism. You list a number of things that, have, that are at stake here. National debt of America, the financial system of America, widening inequality in America, decaying infrastructure in America, which you've already mentioned public ignorance about the world and a gridlock political system, but you point specifically at American ignorance about the world. Yes, I think that is a fundamental problem. We can't have an intelligent foreign policy unless we have an intelligent public, because we're a democracy. Look at the attack on Iraq in 2003. The public basically supported it. We have set impossible goals for ourselves in Afghanistan. We had to go in because of what they did to us from there, Al-Qaeda. But the goals we set were extreme. Uh, we don't have a public that really understands the world anymore. And in the age of complexity, that problem becomes much more difficult. This kind of dialogue and this book will help the public to understand it. And I thank you for coming here. Charlie, as always, it's great to talk to you. <laughs> thank you.